We're looking at Acts and Acts chapter 18 and 19. So we're trying to merge to, as we come to the end of the book of Acts, we recognize that there, um, there, there are um, many of the stories sort of linked together and it's all about Paul's missionary journeys now. So we just really want to join them together and um, see if we can just get the truths that are available to us in these, uh, in these chapters. And we're looking at chapters 8 and 19 today. And um, it's a great book. We're not going to read through those chapters this morning, but I'll encourage you, please, please um, go and read, read through it. Read through the, those two chapters. They have um, significant stories and encouragements, which some of them I'll draw from here today. Um, but but we, we want to be men and women of the word. And it was great last week to be studying chapter 17. You know, and Tim was leading us in in that and looking at the significance of the word of God in our lives. The significance of the Word of God in our lives. And one of the questions that, you know, we were discussing at the end in our home church was, how is the Word central in your life? How is the Word of God central in our lives? You know, in that chapter we read about the Berean um, uh, Christians who, who went and were studying and looked to, to church that everything Paul was saying was true, and it was, um, and it's it's good for us to be um, people who have the word centered in our lives. And some of the answers that we gave as a home church were, you know, that we we said that when the word of God is centered, it is central in our lives. It guides our decision making. It guides our decision making. It guides what we, how we make decisions. The second thing is it influences our thoughts. It influences what we think about. Another thing we talked about was it influences, it guides how we see ourselves. The Word of God guides how we see ourselves. Do you know, have you ever gone to a mirror and stood in front of the mirror and began to admire the mirror? You know, I, I don't know if you've ever done that. If you're doing that, you probably want to buy the mirror. You know, that it might be you've gone to a shop to buy a mirror and you're like, oh, but when you've got the mirror in your home, you never really begin to admire the mirror. Oh, this mirror, this glass is so lovely. You only stand in front of the mirror to see yourself. And the Bible calls the Word of God a mirror that we look at. Not because we want to admire the great words that are in the Bible, oh, these words, but we want to see ourselves through it. So when the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places, we see ourselves as seated in heavenly places. When the Bible says that you are free, you are healed, we see ourselves as free and healed. We don't go there to admire the words, we go there to see who we are who he has created us to be. So we see ourselves through his word and his word guides what we believe. Well, please let the word of God be central in our lives. We're going to look at Acts chapter 18 now and I'm going to read from verse 1 to 5. Let's read from verse 1 to 5 together. Let's just read this together. I want to go. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. I want to introduce to you a couple that Paul met. Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. And then we see Paul. I don't know why they made Paul bold. Most of the pictures of Paul, he was bold in them. So there's something about being bold, you know, that is, uh, there's just something, there's some anointing on that. <laughs> but we see Priscilla and Aquila. 
And I, I, I'm really drawn to this couple because if, if I wanted to title this message, and I've not titled this message, I would title it Live Empty. Live Empty. You know, as I was driving away from church um, on Friday after the news about Nick passing away, I was just heartbroken. And I was thinking of the last time I saw him and just how happy he was. And, you know, and, and he was someone that lived empty. He was someone that, that, that affected everybody's life in one way or the other. You know, that he never led a team, but he was in nearly every team. And if he was in that team, you could not miss him. <laughs> he was so key in every team that he was part of. He wasn't one to do half measures. I remember, um, I think it was probably at the end of last year, he kept coming to me and saying, no, I just want to stop serving in church and I want to receive and I don't want to do anymore. I just want to, to sit down. I've served and served and served. And, and I was thinking, oh, these are danger bells. When people say, I just want to stop serving, I'm like, well, we are created as a body. And I kept encouraging him. you know. And eventually, after one Sunday, I, I think I, um, uh, there was a preach on, on serving. I think Blessing did that preach. He came back to me and said, Henry, I'm not, I'm not staying. I'm not stopping. I'm going to serve. I'm going to carry on serving. And he did. He served to the end. He lived empty. And as I was preparing this, I was just thinking of Priscilla and Aquila. And I was just thinking of their life. And we're going to look a bit into, into them. But they were a couple. I don't know if they had children or not. The Bible doesn't tell us whether they had children or not. But they fled from Rome. They fled from Italy because the, 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 the leader there, Clodus, had, was trying to expel all the Jews out of, out of Rome. And they fled to Corinth. Corinth is in Greece now in our present day world. They fled to Corinth and they were in Corinth and I don't know if they were saved before they met Paul or they were saved after Paul but what the Bible tells us here is that Paul meets them. Paul is introduced to them and they are tent makers so they make tents uh, for a living and Paul was trained as well to in making tents so he comes into this um, um, small group of believers or he meets um, um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila and he finds out they are tent makers and what I love is that they invite him in and and he joins their business. And he stays with them for 18 months. I don't know if you've ever had someone living with you. It's inconveniencing, you know, that's it. And especially when you don't know where they're going to live. You know, they're just there and they're just there. One month turns to two and to three and at first, he starts working with them. So there's a benefit, you know, well, he's helping in the business. But then when Timothy and Silas come, he stops working and then he goes full time. You know, I don't know if he was paying board, you know, or what, but he was living with them. But they gave their lives to him. And as I was thinking about this, the word that came to mind was discipleship. They became disciples of Paul. They began to sit, you know, when they were probably making tents. I can imagine the conversations that were going on. It would have been rich conversations. They grew. They understood the word. They understood what Jesus did. They understood the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They understood all that Paul carried. They would have gleaned as much as they could from Paul while he was there. And they learned. They were hospitable. They welcomed Paul into their home. But what I love was they were not just focused on their business and their career. They were kingdom minded. They were kingdom minded. You know, I love people that have a vision, that have a career, want goals, you know that. I love you when, when, it, when, when, I, when I hear that, you know, actually my dream is to do this, is to do that, you know. It's all great, but please, please, please never let your career be in front of, your king, of the kingdom of God. Our first calling is to be ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors. That's the first thing that he has called us to be. To be ambassadors, we need to be part of a kingdom. We need to be part of a kingdom. We need to be kingdom-minded. We need to carry that kingdom mind into everything we do. Everything we do on earth, we will live here. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have how many houses you have, how many cars you drive, 
How many business, how many millions? It reminds me of, of, of a conversation that I heard. You know, two guys were analyzing when Steve Jobs died. I don't know if you, if you know Steve Jobs, who was one of the people that started Apple. You know, he was what billions? Uh, and they were, they were analyzing how much did Steve Jobs live when he died? And the friend said he left everything. <laughs> he left everything. It doesn't matter how much he was worth, whether it was billions or hundreds, we leave everything here on earth. The only thing that counts after this life is what we do for Christ. The only thing that counts after this life is what we have done for him, what we have done with our lives in fulfilling the kingdom of God in, 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 our, in this world. Priscilla and Aquila were a couple who were given to the kingdom. Let's look at verse 18. Why do I say that? Let's look at verse 18. I mean, um, it says there, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at um, Cyrethene because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed in Caesarea, um, he went up to, the, to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Priscilla and Aquila were willing to go with Paul to sail off. It doesn't tell us that they had pre-planned this or, you know, they planned to stop off in Ephesus. All we see is that they left with Paul and they get to Ephesus and they decide, actually, we're going to stay here. Paul left them there. What I love about it is that in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul is writing to the Corinthian churches. Remember, they left Corinth and they were sailing off and they stopped off in Ephesus. But Paul begins to send greetings and he says, um, Aquila and Priscilla send their greetings and the church in their home. So Priscilla and Aquila stop off in Ephesus and set up a home church in their home. They were sold out to God. They were completely surrendered to God. They were disciples of Jesus and were willing to give everything to walk with him. But they were not just disciples. They were also disciple makers. They were also disciple makers. We go further down again in verse 24. We look at verse 24. Um, next slide, please. Verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandra, came to Ephesus. So someone was visiting Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and thought, thought about Jesus accurately. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debates. Proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Someone visited Ephesus called Apollos. Priscilla and Aquila saw this man. And the Bible says, another version says he was eloquent. He was a great speaker. He was a confident speaker. And he understood the word. But his understanding was limited to a point. He only understood the scriptures up to John's baptism. And we need to remember there was no New Testament there for them to read. It was all spread by word of mouth at this time. 
So his understanding of the scriptures stopped at John's baptism. And when Priscilla and Aquila saw um, um, Apollos, they saw potential in this man. And they decided that actually what I'm going to do is we're going to invite him in. And we're going to teach him more. All these things that Paul had deposited in us, now we can deposit in someone else. And they took all the knowledge that Paul had given to them and they began to teach Apollos. And I love it because even though Apollos was eloquent, he, was, uh, he, he had all the um, uh, orator skills of being able to speak the word, he was still humble enough to learn. He was still humble enough to be taught. And he was willing to understand what the gospel was. And they taught him. They taught him. This morning, before I go on to chapter 19, I just want to ask this question. Two questions that I've got on the screen. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Jesus' disciple had to respond to him by answering his call on their lives to follow Jesus. Priscilla and Aquila had to respond to God's call on their lives to follow Jesus. Have you accepted Jesus into your life today? Have you made him Lord over your life? At the end, I'll have an opportunity for anyone here that hasn't made that decision because it is a decision that we all need to make. We all one day will stand before the king. We all one day will stand before Jesus and we will have to give an account of how we have lived our life. The only thing that will wipe away any wrongdoing in our life is the fact that we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says his blood will cover all our sin. His blood will wipe our slates clean. Are you a disciple of Jesus? We see that in Priscilla and Aquila. Disciples sold out completely, not allowing the, 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 the pool of life, the, the, the career and all of that to, to suck them in and for them to begin to ration their, their commitment to God. But they were all out for him. They were all out for God. And I'm not making a doctrine now to say we all need to leave our work to follow Jesus. God has called you where you are to establish his kingdom. Do you know why he has placed you where you are? Do you know why he has given you what you have? Do you know why you have the business that you have to um, establish God's kingdom? If you don't, I want to encourage you to become a disciple of Jesus. We need to know why we are, where, we, where, where we are. And in that way, we can fulfill God's mandate upon our lives. Whatever he has called us to do. And the second thing, are you a disciple maker? Do you have someone or a few people that you are discipling, you are teaching more about the scriptures? It doesn't matter how little you think you know. It doesn't matter how little you think you know. You have something you can give to someone else. I want to challenge you today. If you don't have someone that you know that actually this is someone I'm pouring into, I want to challenge you today in this next one week, ask God to reveal to you someone that you can pour into and he will reveal to you someone. He will bring to your attention someone that you can pour into. Home churches is such a great environment to do that because you're closely with, with, with other people. When, when they talk, you can find out where this person is. Actually, this person needs more understanding in this area. I know about this. I can meet with them for a coffee and we can talk about this. That's what making disciples is about. God is calling us to do that. Let's move on to chapter 19 now. Chapter 19. I love the start of this verse, of this chapter. It's so powerful. Let's read from verse 1 to 7. It says, while, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus 
on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. I love this scripture because it is, to me, one of the foundational scriptures about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. Paul saw the need of that, that he would not allow them to go without receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, we have not heard anything about the Holy Spirit. What baptism did you, were you baptized into John's baptism? And John's baptism was about repentance. You know, oh, let's prepare. Let's get ready for the Messiah. His baptism was let us get our lives ready for Jesus to come. So there was another step that he needed to take, uh, that they needed to take. They needed to be baptized into Jesus. And when they were baptized, Paul laid his hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of us needs the Holy Spirit. Today, great that we have the scriptures. You know, we don't see anyone baptizing now in John's baptism. You know, that, that's all um, um, gone now. What we see is people getting baptized in Jesus because they have repented. They have, their lives have been transformed. They have become saved and they get baptized. And if you're not baptized here, yeah, I want to encourage you. You know, it becomes disobedience when you keep saying no. It becomes, a disobedience, it becomes disobedience when we keep saying no. So it's a command from God to repent and be baptized. And we have opportunities here regularly. The next time I think is in May, where on the fifth Sunday we'll want to get people seriously wet. And if you are not baptized, I want to encourage you, don't put it off. Don't put it off because what you're saying to God is, I don't really take your word seriously. Because his word says, repent and be baptized. The moment we repent, the moment we give our hearts to him, the next step for us is to be baptized. We see that here, but then also the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important for our lives. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit comes, we see there with two things. It comes with the speaking in tongues and it comes with prophecy. There's something God wants to bring, and I've talked about this many times, but, but I'll mention it again. The, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is one package. The Spirit of God, when the baptism of the Spirit comes upon us, He comes with all the gifts into us. All the gifts of the Spirit, and the Spirit begins to manifest those gifts as we train ourselves up to, to prophesy, as we train ourselves up, as we yield ourselves to the Spirit, the Spirit takes hold, takes control of us, and uses us. Amen. The same thing in speaking in tongues, you know that? You can drive a car that has turbo, but if you never press turbo on the car, it will just drive at normal speed all your life. But the moment that you realize, actually, this car has turbo and there's no speed limit and I can put my foot down, suddenly you see the benefit of that. When these gifts of the Spirit come into us, we can live our lives ignorant of the fact that there are these gifts that He brings into our lives. But the moment that we realize that, I want every one of us to be desperate for the gifts to be desperate for it, be desperate to speak in tongues, be desperate to prophesy, be desperate for the gifts God gives. When you receive the Holy Spirit, those gifts come into us and we are able to prophesy, to give words of knowledge, to give words um, um, uh, to, to heal the sick, to have gifts of faith, working of miracles. Those are the gifts that the Spirit of God brings into our lives. Today, if you need that, if you need that baptism in the Holy Spirit, don't let it, don't let it off. I will give some time after praying for those to get saved. I will give some time for us to pray for those to be baptized in the Spirit. Because it's so important for every one of us to be filled with the Spirit. 
Because when we are filled with the Spirit, we can do what God wants us to do in this world. We see here in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, we see Paul. Paul was, had so much of God inside of him, the power of God inside of him, that his sweat was healing people. He sweat. The Bible says here, yeah, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even his handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. There's power available to every one of us. The same power here that Paul had is available to every one of us. That even his sweat was healing the sick. And driving out demons. Wow. You know, later on in the story, we hear of um, uh, um, some, some brothers, sons of Sceva. Uh, it's a really funny story. Because they thought, you know, well, we've heard about Paul who preaches in this man Jesus. We're going to go and we're going to try and cast out devils in the same Jesus that Paul preaches they didn't realize that there was a process to get that power. And they came and they, uh, one man, they were trying to cast out demons from one man. You know, and they said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. <laughs> they didn't know Jesus. They knew that Paul preached in Jesus' name. And they were trying to, and the Bible says that the man pounced on them. He beat them up so much that they ran out naked. You know, that's, I really find it amazed. Seven grown men were beaten up by one man and they left naked because they didn't understand what was required to walk in the power that Paul walked in. But Paul walked in that power that is available to us today. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to every one of us today. We can walk in it. We can um, live victorious lives in Jesus. We can live victorious lives in Him. And we want to be men and women who live victorious lives. And just moving on to the end of that chapter, we see here, and I'm not going to read it out, but Paul begins to speak in Ephesus. And it causes some problems. You know, there are two things that always happened wherever Paul went. People got saved and people got mad. <laughs> it always seemed like everywhere Paul went, people will get saved and people will get mad. You know, the problem I feel today about, the, about us Christians is we're trying to be too nice. We're trying to make everybody happy about the gospel. The gospel is offensive to many. It will offend many when people, when Jesus was on earth, he was, his, his message was offensive. We see that through the book of Acts, that his message is offensive. We don't need to carry a plaque and say, we are going to offend you. Well, that's not what we need to do. We need to be confident in what God has called us to preach and not try to water it down because we're trying to please men. Amen. We can't change the word of God. The word of God will only have effect if it is undiluted. If we begin to water it down, then it will have no effect in our lives. Paul was not, Paul was, in fact, he was afraid as well too. Because actually you see in verse, in chapter 18, God speaks to Paul and says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid. God will not have to say, do not be afraid if you're not afraid. <laughs> so Paul was a man like us. He was afraid, but he knew that he carried a mandate, a word that everyone needed to hear. And he wasn't going to let that go. He was confident in the word that God had given him. What are you carrying today? What are you carrying in your life today? If you've come here today with burdens, those burdens can be lifted. And I'll invite the band back up right now. Those burdens can be lifted. 
If you're a believer today and you've been a believer for many years, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you still a disciple of Jesus? Do you still have in your heart that actually I want to follow you, I want to live for you, I want to be surrendered to you? Or does life begin to clog our lives up? You know, I never dreamt that I would be a minister of the word. I always wanted to be a businessman. That was my dream. But when I began to feel the call of God, and it meant me living that dream at the cross, I was willing to. But not everybody is called to full-time ministry. But everybody is called to minister. We are all called to be ministers of him. And if today you haven't even started that first step of saying, Jesus, I invite you into my heart, there is an opportunity for you today to do that. I'll just invite us to bow our heads right now. I said this earlier on that if I was to title this message, I would say, Leave Empty. Are you ready to lay your life down for someone who gave his life for you? Are you ready to say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. And if you're watching online, you can respond as well to this message. If you want to invite Jesus into your heart and you say, Henry, I don't and remember a moment where I gave my heart to Jesus. I want to be sure that I have made that commitment to him. I just want you to put your hand up so I know if I'm praying with someone this morning. Is there anyone here today that wants to give their heart to Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just giving a little while because I believe God will speak to us and we will know. Don't leave here without making that decision. Well, I believe every one of us is saved here today. Praise God for that. Well, this morning I want to just invite anyone today as well that wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It might be that your love for Him has grown cold. It might be that you maybe were even baptized in the Holy Spirit a while ago, but right now you don't feel like there's much, you know, and, and Joe was praying in the, in the early morning prayer and he was saying, God, let it not just be a tip on our toes, but a feeling, a complete baptism from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet. That's what we want. The Holy Spirit to baptize us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. And I'm going to invite us to stand right now. If you're just uh, happy to stand. And if you would like to be prayed for, I want to lay hands on anyone this morning. We read that in Scripture where Paul laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit today, I just want to invite you forward this morning. Just come forward and let us pray with you. Let us um, lay hands on you this morning to, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else that wants to come forward this morning? There's power that the Bible gives us. Paul said, have you heard, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? That's my question to you today. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Jesus. Sometimes there needs to be a desperation in our hearts for Him. There needs to be a longing in our hearts for Him. 
You know, we read about there that they spoke in tongues. And I just want to encourage you, if you at this moment don't speak in a tongue, it is practice. It is practice. When you watch a child learning a new language, it sometimes sounds like gibberish. It sounds like nonsense. But actually, God is releasing your tongue. And I just want to encourage you right now. You have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want you to just begin to release yourself to the Holy Spirit. And don't speak in English. Don't speak in English. Just try and begin to speak in a tongue. Begin to speak in whatever uh, the tongue that the Lord gives you. I remember the first words that the Lord gave me when I was a young teenager were two words. Robozi rabazi, robozi rabazi. Those were the two words I knew. For years, those were the two words in tongues I could speak. And I kept persisting. And the more I prayed in tongues, the more I grew in it. The more I began to learn actually how the Lord uses that. It's a process. It's not an instant thing. It's a process. And I want to encourage you as, a, uh, as individuals here, but also as a church. Let us pray in the Spirit. Let's be men and women who use the gifts of the Spirit. There's power when we pray in the Spirit. Paul was so emphatic about how important it is for our Christian lives. And we need to be men and women who walk in the Spirit. Amen. Lord, this morning we exalt you, O God. We choose to lift you high. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your love towards us, O God. Thank you because you have called us, you have set us apart for yourself, O God. Thank you because you have filled us with your Holy Spirit, O God. And you have empowered us for the journey that you have called us into. I pray your blessing right now upon every one of us, O God. Now, Lord, you will go before us, O God. You will strengthen us. You will surround us with your peace, Lord. I pray for anyone today that has a doctor's appointment this week. I speak a blessing upon you. I speak a blessing upon that appointment. That the, that the, the report of the Lord will be what stands in the name of Jesus. I pray for anyone that has a business appointment, a job interview, O God. Lord, I speak a blessing right now upon every everyone, oh God, that is going out into the marketplace, Lord, that they will be ambassadors for you, oh God. They will be your hands and your feet, Lord, and you will be glorified and lifted up, oh God, in our lives. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, because you are worthy of it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.